So, unless you have no interest whatsoever in space exploration, or you've been living the last week or so inside a cardboard box, you should know that SN5 successfully carried out a 150 meter or so hop with almost complete success on August 4th, 2020. What an accomplishment. And although at the moment everybody is cheering and everybody is analyzing what has just happened, almost nobody is talking about what all of this might mean to NASA. And actually, it might mean more than you think. You see, even though many people think that this is a huge triumph of the Starship over the SLS, actually NASA may have been interested in the Starship for a long time now and may already be looking at phasing out the SLS. Sound impossible? Well, as all of you know, or many of you know, NASA has been working on a multi-stage plan to get to Mars, starting off with a journey to the moon. And as this plan has evolved, private companies like Dynetics and Sierra Nevada, who developed this particular, or in the process rather, of developing this lander that you're watching at the moment, are becoming more and more prominent. And things like the Orion that you're looking at right here, and especially the SLS, are becoming less and less prominent. We're looking at private rockets delivering the landers instead of the SLS. We're looking at private rockets like the Falcon Heavy delivering components of the Lunar Gateway instead of the SLS. We're looking at SpaceX being involved in the resupply of the Lunar Gateway and not the SLS. And that's just for openers. As the Artemis budget continues to balloon and the SLS continues to become more expensive, what are we going to look like when we get to this point? Is Congress really going to be willing to improve the insane amount of money that's going to be required in order to get the SLS to Mars? I find it highly unlikely. And I'm not just basing this on my own personal opinions. I'm basing this on a multi-stage plan that NASA has just come out with. When all the fanfare with SN5 was going on, other things were happening at NASA. And in this two-part episode, I'm going to be covering NASA's multi-stage plan to reach not only Mars, but as you can see, other destinations as well. They already have a request out for concepts on various types of vehicles and other types of infrastructure necessary to make these journeys possible. To explore not only the Moon and not only Mars, but various destinations throughout the solar system. It's a thrilling plan that will take man throughout the inner solar system to many exotic destinations. And not only will the Starship possibly be a part of this, in my opinion, it will be absolutely essential to have the Starship as a part of this plan if it is to succeed. And I'm going to explain why this is the case in just a few minutes. Welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. As you can see, we have some changes again. Um, done some changes with some lighting, added some additional lighting. I don't, and the angle as well, by the way. I hope that it's to your liking. But in any event, uh, changes to the set. Um, on top of that, we have a crew dragon here. 
courtesy of Spaceship Mania. Um, however, it is a 3D model, and I don't have a 3D printer, so this was printed for me by Finger Blaster Studios, who also, by the way, is willing to print things for you guys. So in any event, I have both of these folks listed. On top of that, we also, of course, have the Starship here. Um, and I've been advertising that for a while as well. Also from Spaceship Mania, this is not uh, something you need a 3D printer for. Uh, this is something that comes as is. So I've got both of these added to my set here. There's going to be continuing modifications being made, but nevertheless, we'll see how things develop as time goes on. But enough of that. Um, let's move on to uh, move on to the subject at hand. NASA may have been watching what was going on with SN5, as all of us were cheering and extremely excited about the flying grain silo, or whatever you want to call it, um, and its landing, and it went pretty much flawlessly. There may have been some slight structural damage caused by the landing. It's hard to say. Elon Musk is talking about having much better landing gear for the next hop, that sort of thing. But it's all very minor. It was a, it was a massive success. But I'm thinking NASA was watching too, and here's why. Just a few days before the flight of SN5, NASA released a multi- staged plan for the exploration of the inner solar system with very little fanfare, but nevertheless, it involves a very ambitious plan to explore many places in the inner solar system. And what I found to be extremely fascinating is even though the SLS is included during the moon portions of all of this, it is notably absent from everything else. And that I find to be extremely interesting. What might they have in mind for the rest of the plan? Perhaps the Starship? Perhaps they have more confidence that it's going to be ready a little bit quicker than they were thinking before? In any event, regardless of whether they use the Starship or not, the stages of this plan and the ambition of it is simply astonishing. It blew my mind to read it, and I'm going to be relating it to all of you over the course of this two-part episode. It involves not just the moon, not just Mars, but a whole lot more. And so we're going to be covering all of that right now. The phase out of SLS is happening almost right away from the Lunar Gateway, the very beginning of the Artemis project, at least if you take out the SLS itself. Now the power and propulsion element and the habitation and logistics outpost, or HALO, are not going to be delivered by an Orion capsule and an SLS as depicted in this old video, but rather delivered on a single commercial rocket, probably a Falcon Heavy. Scratch this mission for the SLS. And here's the cargo and logistics module. And guess what? SpaceX is taking care of that as well, handling all of the resupply with the Falcon Heavy and the Dragon XL. And although the Gateway has its many detractors, I think it's one of the most important, if not the most important, aspect of Artemis. And I'm not the only one. Elon Musk is not only involved in the resupply of this station, but also in constructing it. And it's not just him. Canada, in February 2019, announced their intention to participate in the Gateway and providing the Canadarm. In October of 2019, Japan announced their plans to join the United States with contributions to the habitation components. In November of 2019, the European Space Agency received authorization and funding to support its planned contributions to the Gateway, including habitation and refueling. Now, as I've mentioned before, all of these countries contributing to this station will ensure the longevity of Artemis. The ISS, because it's had so many international partners, has lasted for two decades in spite of its incredible expense. And this particular station is going to do the same thing. Nobody is going to be willing to cancel this. 
but this little station is going to provide a whole lot more functions than just making Artemis difficult to cancel. On the contrary, this station without a mission as it has been erroneously called has a lot of missions. Because yeah, if you want to go straight to the moon, Moon Direct makes more sense. But damn it, we're not going straight to the moon. As I've said before, the Lunar Gateway serves as a dress rehearsal for our journey to Mars. It is sheer folly to attempt a journey to another planet without simulating what interplanetary travel would actually be like, and this station accomplishes a lot of those purposes, most significant of which is protection from interplanetary radiation and cosmic rays. As many of you know, a station in lunar orbit does not have any significant protection from Earth's magnetic field the way the ISS does. Therefore, it simulates the effect that a ship in interplanetary travel would experience. Therefore, we can experiment with various types of protection against radiation and cosmic rays. But that's not the only benefit. Because of SpaceX resupply, astronauts will be able to stay on this station for months, carrying out multiple visits to the lunar surface if they wish, or also experiments on the station itself with samples and other things they may bring up from the lunar surface. In addition, they will experience the type of isolation that an interplanetary journey would give, including not seeing the Earth every day just a few hundred miles below. In addition, the station's rectilinear halo orbit makes the moon far more accessible to commercial rockets. If you take advantage of the right launch window, it's a lot easier to rendezvous with this orbit than it is to try to land on the moon. A lot less energy and therefore accessible by commercial rockets like the Falcon Heavy whereas it took something like the Saturn V to get all the way to the lunar surface. In addition, this same orbit brings the station extremely close to the moon, allowing landers to use very little energy to reach the lunar surface and return to the station when the time is right, thus allowing reusable landers, such as the one that Dynetics has proposed and SpaceX, and let's hope to God they use one of those two as opposed to the Blue Origin solution. And this isn't all. Quote, over time, the gateway will become a way station for the development of refueling depots, servicing platforms, and a facility for processing samples from the moon and other bodies in the support of science and commerce. The main thing I want to emphasize is refueling depots, something I've emphasized that the gateway should be used for, and others have too, for quite some time. So this station that SpaceX is going to be resupplying could potentially serve to refuel the Starship before it makes its journeys to Mars, instead of multiple refuelings in low Earth orbit. Although, of course, it would take a couple of refuelings in order to reach the Gateway, but still that's a lot different than as many as it would require to reach Mars. If the Starship was able to completely top off its tanks before leaving for Mars, it would be able to do a much more controlled powered landing upon entering the Martian atmosphere, still having a considerable amount of fuel left to execute the kind of landing that we saw SN5 carry out, and a landing very similar to this as opposed to the Starship suicide dive that I've talked about a number of times before. Topping off the Starship's tanks completely with orbital refuelings would require 13 visits. And as I've said before, SpaceX has gotten pretty good at powered landings, and this sort of scenario would lead to a far greater chance of success. But, manufacturing methylox fuel on the moon would be a little bit more difficult than other types of fuel. But here's where we come to another part of Artemis, to where we could provide a fuel depot with a different type of fuel, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the next episode, that could be a real game changer in terms of going to Mars. 
this little guy is called the Viper, and it's one of a series of robots that can be controlled directly from the gateway if necessary in real time in order to search for water ice and other resources on the moon's south pole. Water, of course, can provide a variety of different types of rocket fuels, and another type of fuel, as I said, I'll talk about later. But also, it's the precursors of building a base on the moon, and water at the South Pole is going to be a key component of that base. As a matter of fact, the base on the moon will simply not be possible without it. And by the way, the People's Republic of China already have something like this on the moon's south pole at the moment, currently looking for water ice. So NASA has fallen a bit behind, and they are all too aware of this. So it is absolutely critical that they establish a presence on the south pole of the moon, not only for water, but also for other resources in order to explore the rest of the solar system. Now, I'm not sure how much the ascension of Kathy Leaders to the position of program manager for human spaceflight over at NASA has to do with this, but given that her predecessor is under investigation for unfair competitive procurement practices with Boeing, she may have a different look on things when it comes to what companies should be providing our services to the moon and help us establish things like this. It could very well be that we have a paradigm shift going on at NASA. Nevertheless, once the gateway becomes a propellant depot and once we have mining and a permanent base established on the moon, it stands to reason that the next step is Mars, right? Right? Well, actually, that's not true. Not true at all. In an unbelievably exciting twist, it seems that NASA's next objective is not Mars, but Venus, or rather a quick flyby of Venus. And as improbable as this may sound, it's exactly what's laid out in their plan, and there's lots of very good reasons for them to do it. And not only that, there's also lots of very good reasons for them to use the Starship to help accomplish this. And I'm going to explain how all of this is true in the next episode. But while you're waiting, please go to the description and follow the link to one of the best videos from To The Future, one of my newest Patreon supporters and also one of the strongest supporters of this channel since the very beginning. These folks are the best friends that a space channel could possibly have and are my favorite on YouTube. And yes, that includes my own because they say whatever the hell they want. Huh. That sounds kind of familiar. Oh yeah, and if you want your own starship, head on over to Spaceship Mania, also linked in the description. And they also have the models for the Crew Dragon, which you saw earlier in the episode. And then you can get that printed by Finger Blaster Studios, who I also have linked. Okay, that's about enough of that. So until next time, congratulations to SN5 and their spectacular launch. I never get tired of watching this and get ready for an amazing future in space flight, of which I think the Starship is going to be an important part, even if it is NASA's plan. And next time, you're going to find out exactly why that's the case. So until then, stay angry about space.